school. Well, good morning, everyone. It's always good to be here at Conscious Living on a Sunday morning for our meeting. And welcome to everyone who's watching us, joining us online. Um, it's the first meeting for a couple of weeks, as most of us were in Orlando last week at a marvelous uh, symposium with uh, many, many people, many old friends from all over the US and beyond. So, let's start with today's meeting by first of all starting with a few announcements. Um, these are new new resources. So much are now available in English. Last week, Patrick and I worked on the, the book the bookstore at the convention. And we had about over 50 titles, but there's over 200 titles now in on Spurs in Melbourne English. And many, many more resources are coming available every day. This is um, it's, it's on Spurgis Network TV, which you can find by just Googling that. And it's actually a, a beautiful letter written by Chico in 1966, it's written in English. So um, again, something worthwhile pursuing and, and learning a little bit more. Another resource is through the United States Spurgis Federation. Uh, this too shall pass. Um, is it just video. Sorry? It's an inspirational video. Inspirational video. I don't know if it refers to the times we're in at the moment, but uh, I don't know if you, like me, I'm feeling a little concerned of what's going on in the world. And maybe that's something that can help us give a bit more of a, a spiritual angle to understand all these conflicts that are going on. Um, this is a new channel by the Spiritist Federation, I think in Atlanta. By Atlanta. Atlanta, yeah. Um, Good News Channel, again, you can find it uh, by searching for Good News Channel. And um, sources of, again, more inspiration, more videos. Okay, with that, we'll just quick reminder on the course that we, we have at Centre on, on, on Zoom. Um, every other Wednesday in English, second and fourth Wednesday of the month, with Susanna leading the group. Um, very interesting discussions basically on the Spiritist Review. We're now in the, the first book of March. In March, we've got 11 books to go, so we've got quite a lot of work ahead of us. But always a lot of good discussion. This last week, we were looking at um, the plurality of worlds and talking about Jupiter and uh, the Spiritist inter Interpretation. On Sunday mornings, um, we have our Genesis class. We had it this morning at 9 o'clock. Um, again, a very interaction group. Today, we, we started with the well, we're studying the miracles, but we ended up discussing the situation in the world today and how we can interpret it from again from a spiritist angle. So always, always welcome to join us, um, please, 9 o'clock Sunday morning. And then on Wednesdays, uh, Realms of Mediumship by Carlos again, that's at 9 o'clock at night. The IDs and password can be found on our website. And now to today's reading. Um, this, is, this is from the book Happy Lives. Psychographed by Bilaldo Franco from the Spiritual Energy Angels. And number 74 goes like this. Don't fret over what you cannot finish right away. Do what is possible in terms of effort and dedication and avoid the discouragement that comes with apparent failure. When a task exceeds your capacity or when circumstances get in the way, your real task is to remain calm. Those who do all they can achieve the most. And what you cannot finish now, you will finish tomorrow, if you remain faithful to your commitment. Again, as always, a short, succinct message with a lot of uh, interpretations, a lot of thought-provoking ideas. Um, so easy, so many times we, we start taking a task and uh, find some obstacles along the way and, and, and give up. But that's not what we should be doing. We should be persevering, not getting disheartened, and uh, stay true to the cause. So with that said, I'd like to invite you all to join us in a short opening prayer, asking our dear friends, the good spirits, to be with us today. Help us calm our minds, open our hearts, so we can take in the messages that will be delivered to us today. And specifically we ask that the good spirits, the guardian angels, our dear friend Susanna, help her deliver the message with love, with understanding, with clarity. So again, we can all take that message home with us and more importantly, put it into practice in the days that come. And so be it. So I now invite Susanna to deliver today's story.
was it again? Alternate and function? The alternate and tag. Alternate and tag. Ha. Great. Perfect. Piece of cake. When you have a young mind helping <laughs> you. Um, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning to everyone who is watching online or at some point. Um, so today we are going to talk about the lack of self-love. And this is chapter three of this book, uh, Finding Peace and Health by the Spirit of Juan Angelis. The last lecture was chapter one, which was the evolution of um, thought. And today we are going to tackle chapter three. Eventually I'll go back to chapter two. We talk about crisis. Um, and those are the subtitles that she has in the chapter. Self-condemnation, self-pity, and self-awareness. Now, she tells us that one of the statements in this chapter is that um, lack of self-love thrives within the social organism, capturing unaware victims. So it's prevalent in our society, but if I would ask you, do you love yourself? Don't need to answer. Some people I think would um, stop for a second and think, what does that mean? What does that look like, loving myself? Some people would raise their hands quickly and probably accurately, because I think a lot of times we do love parts of ourselves, but also in great denial or unawareness of their own mechanisms of um, lack of self-love and how that actually expresses and is present in our daily lives. And some people would just say straightforward, no, I don't like myself. So we live in a culture and we have a history and a background when we think about our many incarnations and the way that we have been educated um, and exposed to religions over the course of, you know, centuries. It's very ingrained in all of us, the idea of sin and the idea of self-punishment as a way for salvation, as a path for salvation. You err, you a sinner, you deserve, you deserve to be punished. And a lot of times the punishment comes from nowhere else, but from within. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is this really what we are supposed to do? Is this really what life or God expects from us? Is this really the path for salvation, which in spiritism we understand to be peace of mind? to be that state of harmony uh, within. So when we look at uh, Joanna, she starts like at the very first, uh, the very beginning of the paragraph, the, first, the, the beginning of the chapter, forgive me. She talks and she tells us that the source of lack of self-love is in our ancestral legacies. And by that, she means all the mistakes, all the errors, all the times that we violated God's laws in this lifetime, in previous lifetimes. And these violations and these errors, they are stamped. They are deeply um, engraved in our core or if you will, they are in the unconscious archive. So we all bring deep in our memories, in our spirit, the memories of these experiences. Anything that is, sometimes we get really like, um, 
shocked with some physical pain that we might endure during our lifetime. But later on in life, we're not going to remember that physical pain. Mm -hmm. Because what marks us is not the physical pain, but if that physical pain was associated to a traumatic event with emotional consequences, that stays in us. So it's not the cut, but it's what was associated with that cut. Did you cut because you fell from the bike? Or did you cut because you were seeking to feel something in a process of self-harm? Very different experiences. The cut might be the same, even the depth of the cut. But the emotional experience attached to that cut is very different. So anything that is loaded emotionally stays within us. And so our errors, our violations, our mistakes stay engraved in our core, in these archives. And they manifest in our daily lives in the forms of conflicts, um, insecurity, fear, instability, and she talks us escape mechanisms. We're gonna talk about escape mechanisms. These escape mechanisms, they, they hide the conflicts. So this, this process leads to this very small, low disappearance of our self-esteem and is gonna culminate in the lack of self-love. Now. When you don't love yourself, then you are going to be your own enemy. And this creates this cycle of like suffering, of misery, of self-condemnation, of self-criticism, of isolation, and so forth. We're going to look into it a little bit more in details. But I think what is really important to understand is that underneath this entire process there is guilt so guilt is really the culprit of the entire cascade of events that we see happening and she states this is so because of the torments of guilt dating back to still unresolved experiences so let's talk a little bit about guilt is guilt good or bad? Who thinks guilt is good? Raise your hands. Well, you think guilt is good? Okay, all right. Well, I'm, and who thinks guilt is bad? Okay, and some of you don't think. Okay, so the thing is that guilt is necessary. Mm -hmm. When someone kills and feels no guilt, is a psychopath, <laughs> right? If you kill someone and you have no feelings, no remorse, no regrets, no nothing, you are seriously ill. So guilt is a natural mechanism that tells us it's like God's alarm within our own conscience that makes us feel uncomfortable and tells us something is wrong. There is a violation, right? Um, an error that was um, committed. And so a, a guilt conscience is not necessarily a bad thing. What is bad is when our conscience collapses, which is an expression used by the spirit Andrew Lewis uh, in his books. So we're gonna look a little bit at difference between a guilt conscience and a conscience that collapses, that crumbles, okay? So, when we violate the law and we commit a mistake and we feel guilty, then it is, there is that level of inner discomfort. It is like, I like to think of it as a bank account. Our emotional being has a bank account. We either making the positive or we are withdrawing. So every time we commit a violation, we withdraw. So we're a little bit more poor. We feel a little bit more in that place of lacking, of scarcity, of drought. Whereas when we are acting in a loving way, and especially when we are giving and, and, and growing and benefiting someone, we feel like we have make a deposit and we feel like we feel alive, we feel good, we feel abundant. So that's kind of the balance of, um, of life. And guilt is just like a, you know, guilt means we just did a withdrawal from our bank account. We have a little less at that moment. 
So there are two psychic trajectories that we can do once we commit an error, and that is really what I would like for us to focus. So one of them is the trajectory of remorse. Now, remorse is anchored in pride. So what does that mean? When we enter a state of remorse, we are having a very, um, an experience that again is born from pride. How does that sound? It sounds like this. Um, it's those moments where you do something and you say to yourself, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. Oh my God, I should have not done that. How could I possibly been able to do something like this? So if we hear ourselves, what is behind those statements? This is not me. This does not reflect who I am. It was an accident. It was, it's something out of ordinary. And a lot of times we are going to um, move into other uh, mechanisms that I'm gonna talk about. For instance, projection, <clears throat> not taking responsibility, uh, putting the problem into the circumstances, into the people, but it's never you, <laughs> right? So it's a very proud, a uh, place to be when you when you say to yourself how could i've done that dude that's you mm -hmm. <laughs> all right that's still you whatever you think you are sorry to burst your bubble but that ain't you not yet it will be you one day but you're not there yet so when you come into this place of remorse you get stuck why? Because you keep ruminating these sentences and these questions. You keep, you enter into a mechanism that is extremely destructive, which is self-criticism and self-condemnation. You are, it, it doesn't go forward. You swallow and it comes back and you ruminate again. And you swallow and it comes back and you're stuck in that. So it is truly the result of the no acceptance that you are human and as such errors are a natural part of your evolutionary process. Actually, God created us like this. And just like when your child is learning to ride a bicycle and he or she falls, you don't go and say, you should feel horrible that you just fell from your bike. How could you fall from the bike? Well, you don't have yet the skills to ride the bicycle. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that is just the natural process. That's how you learn to ride a bicycle. Well, that is how you learn to ride life. Mm -hmm. You have to fall and make mistakes and learn from the mistakes. So that is the natural process. So part of our suffering and our difficulty and the self-criticism that is, can get pretty extreme and pretty devastating is our inability to accept that this is God's will. This is God's process. This is how it's meant to be, but we have a diff our egos have a difficult time in accepting God's process and our own humanity. So we get into, again, this self-criticism that is extremely destructive and that brings an incredible layer of uh, suffering on top of that natural discomfort. The discomfort needs to be there, but now we are immersed in suffering. And so here I put together a new cycle where you go from error to guilt to suffering. This is kind of a, uh, the natural process, but then remorse is what keeps you going in this uh, cycle that you can't break unless you do something different. So 
you go from remorse to self-punishment and criticism and lack of self-love, which is in itself an error, and it keeps going on and on and on. And that keeps you stuck in this place of fear. So you become so scared of actually making other errors that a lot of times you choose no longer to try. Mm -hmm. So that is, we're going to get back to that, but that is, we see that when this process becomes very pathological and people, for example, dive into depression, what is depression if not the person withdrawing from life? To err is so incredibly painful that I will not play anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be stuck here in isolation, not moving, no longer living, no longer engaging because it destroys me. It destroys me. The feeling that I am human. So... Maybe you don't relate to that experience, but I think to one level or another, it's present in everybody's life. Maybe we not experience that level of disconnection and criticism, but that is very, very, very hurtful and creates an incredible barrier for our own evolution, for our own growth, because by no means, by no means, this is the path. And this is what life expects from us. And this is what God wants for all of us. So we had in our mediumistic group recently a spirit who stated, I crawl on the ground without strength and merit to stand up. So a, 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 a spirit manifests itself. And this was the spirit mindset. And that really struck me because I was actually studying for this. And when we are outside of our physical body, this state of mind becomes so real because we know that what we think of ourselves manifests, manifests. Our thoughts are creating our reality. But that reality is felt in our physical body because what I think of myself, what I feel about myself is delivered to my energetic being and is assimilated by my physical body. And that is the connection between mind and body and the mind being the source of our, all our physical illnesses. Now, when you don't have a physical body and all you have your spiritual body, the spirit is going to tell you in this type of meetings, meetings that they feel like, they, they, they literally feel, and it's really real. They can't stand up because the force of the criticism, the force of the condemnation keeps them attached to the ground. And that becomes their spiritual and physical reality. Now, we're in a physical body, so we experience things differently, but we can be crushed to that level. And this level of criticism can become serious, serious pathological diseases and disorders that we see nowadays. Of, for example, dissociation. A mind that dissociates is a mind that is deeply, deeply guilt and cannot deal with reality. So dissociation, depression, all, all somehow and somewhat and at some level connected with the feelings of guilt. <clears throat> so we have two, two big manifestations which are self-criticism and self-depreciation. Uh, uh, so you start to feel like you're not worth anything, you're not good for anything, um, you shouldn't even exist, it can get to that point, right? So that's when people start contemplating uh, suicide, having suicide, suicidal ideations, for example, and they become also convinced 
that they are incapable of changing their situation, that they are incapable of overcoming their internal conflicts, and they start also coming up with a number of justifications why they are in that condition and why they cannot leave that place where they find themselves. So self-criticism and self-depreciation. The next step is self-condemnation. So now you are behind bars in your own mind with no mm -hmm. parole in sight, with no uh, chance of redemption. We are, we are the most severe judges of ourselves, right? So sometimes, <clears throat> Sometimes my mom is to see with me for two months, so she's after me telling me things that I should be doing different. And sometimes I feel telling her, you don't need to tell me those things because I know them. I am after them myself every single day. I don't need an extra voice because my inner voice is much louder than yours. <laughs> so I'm good. It's good enough to have my own inner judge. Uh, you don't have to add to the misery. <laughs> So, um, of course, she says that from a place of love. But anyway, so when it comes to self-condemnation, Joanna says that this is a regrettable attitude rooted in previous experiences. And as the spirit reincarnates, guilt becomes an unconscious punishment which individuals feel that they need in order to self-exonerate. So, again, it's within us, and we feel like we have this idea that we need to nurture that guilt because that is the path for salvation or for self-exoneration. Uh, and she will highlight that self-criticism, self-condemnation, those are all escape mechanisms. What are we escaping from? We're escaping from our own humanity. We're escaping from taking the other... Uh, psych trajectory, which starts with taking responsibility, which is anchored in humbleness, not in pride. It's anchored in one's ability to say, without shame and without devaluation, I'm just human. This is it. You know, it's everything is okay. And we'll talk about how to go the other in the other um, direction. But so, she says, this is also a escape mechanism where, um, you know, you stay on that punishment, you keep yourself emotionally behind bars, and you become, you know, you, you carry that internal warden. Does anyone have an internal warden? I, I, mine is like big, huge, strong, and it's always on my heels, always on my heels, right? So... But again, that can become the incredible obstacle in our relationship, in the relationship between our ego and ourself, and a wall in our journey towards uh, growth. Another mechanism that she talks about is projection. Okay, so projection is transfer of responsibility. So, like I mentioned before, is when you, when you find yourself justifying your mistakes and saying, but, but, but my mother, but my husband, but my children, but my neighbor, stop for a second and listen to yourself, right? But the circumstances, but you know, the, the work environment, but these and that, the, you, you all, you transferring from within to outside, you're placing elsewhere. Another thing that you can pay attention to is when people are very critic of others. Criticism of others is usually an incredible, incredible indication that you are identifying outside of you aspects that you reject in yourself. There are a lot of people that, and sometimes that other people, it's us, who are, we get so stuck into 
observing people's shortcomings. I know some people that when you're with them, that's all they talk about. It's like the entire conversation revolves around identifying what people are doing wrong or what we find ugly or what we find that shouldn't be. And so that is a misplacement. That is a projection. That is a waste of time in the sense that all the energy that's being used to identify things outside could be used to look within. So envy, envy is another thing that is so human and so difficult to identify. If I would ask you, are you envy of others? The vast majority of us would say, no, that's not me. And I would say, sorry, you blind. <laughs> because a lot of times, so for example, I'll give you an example. I like to give examples so things can become a little bit more concrete and not so philosophical. There are some characteristics that I see in others and I envy. So for example, if I see someone and I have someone in my relationship that is super calm, right? Sometimes I will criticize that and say, this person is so laid back. Because it's easy for me to criticize and diminish the other than to say, I envy that state of calmness. But I can get there. One path is to say, I truly wish I could, could have that as well. Let me see what is it that I need to do in order to get there. What is the inner work that I need to perform in order to be more calm, right? But because I envy and because it irritates me, because I feel like I can't have that, so instead of taking responsibility, I put the other person down. I, I put a negative twist on that. So now that envy is turning into hostility, into attack, into diminishing someone else. So the spirit Amelia Rodriguez in one of her books, she will say, instead of elevating myself, I try to bring the other person down to my level. And that's what we commonly do. But that all comes from this place where we are not dealing with our own stuff and we are projecting. So these are all, again, escaping mechanisms, things that distract us from the work that we have to do. The other thing that she talks about is self-pity. And she says, self-pity is a dishonest condition of incapacity. It's a belief of life abandonment. Poor me. Look at me. I am so unfortunate. Life is so unfair. This situation is very unfair. So we victimize ourselves. We feel sorry for ourselves. And again, we're stuck in a place where we can't move forward. And a lot of times, what we are seeking is a magical solution for our problems. Something that we can just, you know, take a pill maybe and change things uh, very quickly or rapidly. Sometimes the spirit is not used to failures. And so it becomes very difficult and, 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 and not only not used to failures, but not used to the effort, the work that comes after failing, which is the work of getting yourself up, which is the work of restarting, which is the work of rebuilding, which is the work of seeking ways to create a new reality. And she says, it's, you know, it's another way to escape. So you escaping again from yourself by entering into this process of self-pity. At first, you attract people. People come to you. How can I help? What can I do for you? People feel sorry for you. But then at some point, 
you start putting, pushing people away because you're truly not interested or you don't believe you can leave that state of things. So people come to you and you start put, pushing people away and you end up in this state of like isolation. So I put together all these terms here that she talk about. So we're looking at this path of guilt, uh, that uh, a guilt conscience associated with resentment. And if you want to verify whether we are in this path or not at any given time, we can look at feelings of condemnation and punishment, criticism, projection, envy, devaluation, hostility, all those things uh, bring us to this place of shame, of dislike, we feel ashamed of ourselves and that doesn't help with anything, it makes you feel even worse, right? And now you isolate, you accommodate in that place and, um, and again, she talks about this accommodation as a morbid pathological accommodation and it takes you to this place where life becomes very blurry, right? So you are unable in this place, in this dark place, in this hole that you, because when you, when, you, when you walk in circles, you, you cave a hole for yourself, depending on how many times, right? You keep walking and it mm -hmm. keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So you put yourself into this hole and now you can no longer see with uh, clarity, you're short-sighted to uh, all the blessings of life, all the talents that you have, because we all talented, we all have resources within and outside of us, and we, we, we're stuck in this absolutely uh, huge misunderstanding again of what is the life uh, expects from us. Another spirit share with us this um, statement. He says, my task is to create walls and to guard them. Walls isolate. We see things that you don't see. Now, this is a spirit that was um, engaged in an obsessive process, okay? So he was, um, we would call an obsessor, mm -hmm. right? So what he's telling us is that he's creating walls so that we don't get in contact with our own inner world, our own realities. They see things that we don't see. What is it that they are seeing that we don't see? Our own resolved guilt. Guilt is the most perfect plug for any obsessive process. It starts with self-obsession because believe it, that process that I talk about, the remorse, the, 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 the reliving, the revisiting, this is self-obsession. You, you become obsessed with your own destructive thoughts and patterns. And that creates this incredible plug for an obsession to take place. And so it is a wall that it's built for what? For real growth, for you to be able to move forward to move towards your own self. So she's gonna conclude by saying, the lack of self-love is a behavior disorder requiring special care in order not to degenerate into self-aversion on its way to becoming even more serious conflicts such as self-hatred, self-resentment and disinterest for life. Self-condemnation is a behavioral disorder which must be combated right away due to its inherent conflict, conflictive implications. So one way or another, this is a behavioral disorder, okay? So we all have a little bit of this. So what can we do differently? Guilt conscience, transforming remorse into regret is a path to peace and mental health. So in the book, uh, heaven and hell in the there's a the moral code um, for uh, hold on one second uh, yeah the moral code for the future life 
So it is, um, you know, the, the, a whole bunch of laws that help us to, um, to amend and to progress, right? So in there, we have regret, expiation, and reparation. So instead of remorse, we're talking about regret, and then expiation, which is the, the, the process of repairing the discomfort, the effort that goes into, and reparation, amend, which is to fix what was wrong. So when we go into this path, we no longer have a cycle. We, you, you commit a mistake, you have your guilt conscious, you feel the discomfort, but instead of remorse, we're gonna change that for regret. And with regret, we don't go into a cycle, we go forward. Because regret will take us to a place of self-awareness and responsibility and will generate movement and help. So Joana reminds us that life is a hymn of praise to progress. Life's values are, posit are of a positive nature, never manifesting through perturbing or afflictive methods. So basically she's reminding us that this whole madness with self-criticism and self-condemnation is pathological and it's not what life expects from us because life wants progress, life is progress. Progress is actually a law of nature and the values of nature are always positive, are always uplifting, are always loving and never meant to keep us down, to put us down. On the contrary, when we think of Jesus, who is the highest and the most pure representation of the law, every time he dealt with mistakes and sins and errors, his words were of encouragement, were uplifting, and always in the sense of, uh, of restoring dignity, dignity to the person who had committed the, the mistake. So the other path, the healthy path is regret, which is again, anchor into humbleness, okay? So I wanna share with you an example. And that's why I have the traffic citation over there. So you can really understand what that is. True story about me. Uh, so I was, um, I teach at Nova, and if you park at the parking lot at Nova, you need to have a sticker, and you also need to register your car with the university. Well, um, a, a colleague of mine said, here, take this sticker, and she said to me, you, but you have registered your car, right? And I was like, ah, yeah, I registered a long time ago. I knew, I knew that every year I had to uh, register the car again. So I put the sticker and many, many, many times I went to the university and I parked my car and I, nothing happened. Until recently, I went to teach and I was there teaching for three hours. And when I come, there's a ticket on my uh, window, which cost me one hour of my work that day. And I called the, uh, the, the security department and I said, why do I have this ticket? I had this, the sticker in my car and um, I know that my car is registered with the university. And the guy said, but it, the registration is not recent. It has to be every year. So I said, okay. And I hang up the phone and I paid the, the ticket, but I knew that. Okay, so on my way home, I could have done two things. I could have said to myself, Oh my God, how could I do this, right? Oh my God, I should have never done that, okay? So saying to myself, all right, you're better than this. This was an accident. This is like, you, it was just a little messed up, but you know, you should have been that place. That really does not represent who you are or where you are. Instead, because I was preparing this lecture, I went home reflecting, this is who I still am. This is where I am. And you know who I am? I am someone who is capable of breaking the law. I am someone who remains able to violate the law. 
hard to swallow, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. So when the gospel says to me, before pointing your fingers to anyone, make sure, make sure that that issue is no longer within you, I ask myself, who am I to point fingers to anyone who is breaking the law? How am I different than them? Do I really stand in a moral place where I can say that? Because whether you're stealing a bank, whether you are taking the money of your parents' wallet, whether you are not doing your income tax properly, it's the same violation. It's an error, it's a violation in the same way, maybe more or less. But you know what? The gospel also tells us that it's not the size of the violation, it's the amount of awareness. So someone might steal a million dollars from a bank and someone might steal 10 bucks from a wallet, but if the person who stole 10 bucks knew better than the one who stole one million, that conscience, is more in trouble. So it's not how much you stealing or how big the violation is, it's how much you knew before you committed the violation. So it was a very humbling awareness. So I say, I am someone still capable of doing that. What is that I need to learn. How can I do better? Am I going to put myself in jail? Or am I going to say, this is who I am. Let me pay more attention so that I don't violate the law, either Caesars or Jesus in any way. Because it's a withdrawal, right? It costs me effectively one hour of my work I was pissed, <laughs> right? But I hopefully I won't do it anymore. I'm not even gonna say 100% because this is still who I am. I'm working on it. I want to make sure that as much as possible, I don't break the law, whether I agree or not, because the laws are to be followed, all of them, right? So every ascent, requires a personal contribution on the part of the candidate who must make an effort not to retreat in face of natural defeats. So I can beat myself, I can say I'm a horrible person, look where I am, I knew better, yeah, I knew better. And that's another a common mistake that we do. We know things, but the fact that we know things doesn't mean that they have been internalized and have become part of who we are. It just means that we know. But knowing and being are two separate things. So, yes, knowing is already ways in our conscience for sure, but it's not a reflect of where we are, because where we are it speaks about our internalization of our knowledge into actions and feelings. So it takes effort. We cannot retreat. We don't we if we, if we stay humble, anchored in humbleness, we will find the strength to get up and move forward. Those who are afraid of the journey can never reach the higher peaks. And if they fear the liberating heights, they linger in the valley of morbid lamentation, indulging self-punishment. So again, it goes back to what I mentioned in the very beginning. Um, fear can paralyze us, the fear of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I'm gonna hurt somebody else, so I, will, I, I, will, I choose not to love. So many people close themselves for relationships because they are afraid of hurting and getting hurt. But that's the only way to learn to love is to engage in love. And love is the very reason of life. So again, we have to make peace with this state of things. <clears throat> in closing, in closing, 
I will leave you with this final statement. A logical understanding of the evolutionary mechanisms allows for self-forgiveness in an outlook that is more on par with one's evolutionary level. With room to make mistakes, but also do things right. To lose one's balance, but also to regain it. To develop a disease, but also, and most importantly, to conquer health. This is where Spiritism really helps us. Understanding the evolutionary path, understanding the progress, understanding that every single stage is part of natural evolution. I, I mentioned this in other lectures. When you are in second grade and your handwriting is not beautiful, the second grader is not guilty of that. Rather, he or she understands that once he gets to more advanced grades, their handwriting will be better. But that handwriting is what he and she has for today, for that moment. We are where we are. This is where what we have for today. The first path for self-transformation is to understand the law of life. This is the way. It's one step. It's one grade at a time. And each grade will be able to do more or less. Make peace with that. Embrace the human. Understand that errors are actually the steps necessary steps for uh, ascension and embrace your humanity, right? So with self-compassion, with self-forgiveness, but also with responsibility. Mm -hmm. That is the key factor, is to take responsibility, to say, I messed up. But instead of banging yourself down, right, is say like, Paul said to Jesus on his road to Damascus, Lord, what's next? Mm -hmm. What's next? And this question is what's next is uh, uh, a propelling force that will keep us going and granting us each day more and more freedom and peace. So thank you so much. Thank you, um, <laughs> thanks for super illuminating talk really was uh, a lot of food for thought i think we've all got some traffic uh, stories but <laughs> I, i've got one that um with progressive i have an app on my phone now which um reports every month on my driving in different categories acceleration braking speed limit uh, diversion using cell phone you know and I, I i pride myself on the number i've achieved until last week i got a, a citation from bar harbor police i went to a red light so Often that self-confidence can you know, expand the ego and, and do things that we shouldn't really do. And that was $158, which I very, very much. The good news is it doesn't go to points because they don't know who was driving, so that's the good news. But anyway, thanks again, Suzanne. I love that you know, the, your, um, the uh, slice of it was really powerful, very, very, really compliment. And Suzanne, as we all know, is a fantastic author, fantastic writer. But, often very difficult, so I think it very well into words, it's very good. So the book is, again, which book is it, sorry? Um, no. No, it's good, But anyway, all the, all the um, Joanna books are available on thealpublisher.com, and uh, certainly worth reading. Okay, so with that, we're going to the second part of our meeting today, which is the, the passes. Um, those watching online, we recommend you get a glass of water and just meditate with us. Um, I'm sure you'll receive the benefit of the good spirits that are here. And with that, I ask the past givers to help oh, to give us today. Yeah. So, just a little opening prayer to help us settle our mind and attune to the good spirits that are with us. We ask that you help us receive the energies we're about to receive. As always, your support, your guidance, although it will never detract from our own free will, will help us make those right decisions to avoid any, any guilt or regret. So again, we thank you for your presence and so be it.
So if we come to the end of our meeting today, let us express our sincere thanks to the good spirits that give us, that supported us, but give this opportunity to come together, to open our hearts, our minds, to the wonderful message of today. We also ask in these times of troubles in the world, help us understand this is a, a planet of transition, that this is part of the learning process and accept what we can do in our own sphere, our own contacts with our family, friends, neighbours, help spread that love, spread that understanding. But also we ask good spirits, somehow guide those who are in positions of power, making, causing a lot of the troubles and conflicts in this world. Let's pray for them, help them see the light, see that the way forward is only through love, not through war, not through ego, but just pure love. So once again, as we close our meeting today, we thank you, our dear Lord, our good spirits that are guiding us. And again, as always, help us put the learnings of today into practice. Most important is to understand, but more important still is to put into practice to action for the good. And with that, we'll end our meeting today. Thanks again. So be it. Okay, my dear friends. Have a wonderful week.